Okay, so we begin with the opening prayers on page one of our of our uh, Buddhism 101 book. Uh, and the first prayer is the altruistic motivation. So we recite these prayers twice in English and once in Tibet, usually. And uh, But we can recite them all in English or we can recite them all in Tibet, whichever we prefer, as we're learning them. So it's important to understand the meaning. So let's recite this and then we'll come back and talk about the meaning of, of uh, these prayers. So we recite this together out loud, everybody using their full voice. Uh, please keep your microphones muted so we don't feed back on each other, but it is important to recite these out loud. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Dagla dang wa je pe dra no pa je pe ge Dar pa dang tam she ken pe bar du jo pa je pa tam she ki so je pe Ma nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang den Dog now dang drell nor do la na me pa yang dag pa zog pe zhang ju brin po she to pa zha. So the meaning of this prayer, this is the altruistic motivation. So of course altruism is having our brotherly, sisterly love for each other. The things that we do, altruis altruism. So we recite this prayer in order to motivate, to uh, set our intention that we are helping other beings. So the first line is all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me. So all mother sentient beings, we regard all beings. It's important to be able to look at all beings, whether we know them or not, as being our mother. We think that we've had many, many lives and that for each one of our lives, of course, we had to be born and we had to have a mother. So as we would not want to have any harm come to our mother, someone who raised us, an auntie or, or grandmother or grandfather or father, whoever was the one who taught us how to um, take care of ourselves, taught us how to eat, taught us how to take care of ourselves with hygiene and so on like that. Um, this person who showed us great love and compassion is like our mother. So we regard all beings as being our mother. And this way we can look at all beings and think that, that no matter who they are or where they come from, that we would treat them the same as we would treat our mother. Sometimes these beings, it may seem, are do, want to do us some harm. And these beings especially we have to think of as our mother because they may not realize the suffering that they're causing, but despite that, we would still try and treat them with loving kindness and compassion, just as our mother treated us with loving kindness and compassion as we were growing up. So all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me. So whether it's somebody in our neighborhood, whether it's somebody halfway around the world, someone who has intention to bring harm to us, to our families, to our friends, whatever, we're trying to look through their anger to be able to see that, that they are good people at, at the core and it's their uh, misconceptions that are causing their hatred. So we're trying to help those beings. The next line says, 
uh, obstructors who harm me and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. So the way in which these these people are manifesting their, their anger, their aggression, their desires, etc., is to be able to interfere with, with my growth as a human being, as a spiritual being. So if I look at them as being my mother, it helps me to be able to uh, forgive them of what it is that they may not understand and see if I can't through my my act activities with them to be able to help them to recognize the suffering that they're causing and the suffering that they're feeling within themselves that is uh, giving rise to this hatred that they're showing. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. So I'm trying to show them happiness. I'm trying to show them to be free from suffering. And I'm trying to help them in uh, their unsurpassed, perfect, complete, precious Buddhahood, that they may attain that for themselves. So um, to it's easy for us to be able to want to help our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, people that we're friendly with, people that we know, but it's much more difficult for us for people who have these harmful intentions toward us. So this becomes part of our practice to be able to help all beings, especially the ones who intend to bring harm to me and to others. So this is our altruistic motivation to help all these beings. <clears throat> the next prayer is the action bodhicitta prayer. Bodhicitta is two words, Sanskrit words. Bodhi means enlightenment, and citta means the heart. And in the heart is the big mind. So the enlightened heart mind, we say. The enlightened heart mind, the holy enlightened mind, is bodhicitta. And bodhicitta is loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So all the enlightened beings have bodhicitta. All, and we, we have it within us. We have that potential within us. And what we're trying to do is to draw attention to it as, uh, in our own mind so that we can, um, we can uh, uh, be stable in that and we can promote that with other beings. So Taking action, bodhicitta, means to actualize that holy enlightened mind, that holy enlightened mind. So we do that through this, this action, and we see that we'll recite this in English. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. I'm just setting up my screen here a second. We repeat this again, please. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. In Tibet, they say do song mage gi bar du lu na gi som ge wa la ko. Ma she bar du lu na gi som ge wa la ko. Do they ring ne sung te ni ma sung ta sam gi ba du lu na gi sam ge wa la ko. So here to put this bodhicitta into action, we're saying that thus until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with my body, my speech, and my mind. Until death, I will perform virtuous deeds with my body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I will perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. 
So what this is saying is that now I will do everything I can with my body, speech, and mind to help other beings. Until my death, I will continue to do these virtuous deeds with my body, speech, and mind. And from now until tomorrow, tomorrow never comes. So we continually do this. There's no expiration date for action bodhicitta. We continually do this over and over again. Everything that we do is for the enlightenment of other beings. By way of doing this, we're overcoming our selfish tendency to want to do things just for ourselves, selfishly. But what we're trying to develop is a stability in our selflessness. So by dedicating ourselves, by devoting ourselves, that everything we do with our body, speech, and mind is for the enlightenment of other beings. Helps us to purify our confusions, to help to purify our hatred and our misdeeds, our, our uh, desires, and so on. So uh, the more that we do this prayer, the more that we recognize the meaning of this and the more that we we become the embodiment of the of all these prayers the more that we're able to purify ourselves and keep ourselves on the path to become stable in having a holy enlightened mind and having our bodhicitta so then we go and we're going to skip a couple prayers we come to this short refuge prayer Taking refuge is taking refuge in the three jewels. The three jewels is the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So the Buddha was a human being like us who lived 2,600 years ago. And the Buddha was able to attain enlightenment. And then he began to teach the method that he was able to use to attain enlightenment. And that is called the Dharma. So we say that that is the speech. First is the, the Buddha, the, the mind of the Buddha, what it was that had this experience of enlightenment and the mind of what it is to be able to articulate that is the Dharma, the articulation of that mind, of that, that heart mind that we talked about a moment ago. And then to be able to spread this, to be able to, to have a community of people that are part of this would be the Sangha. So it's the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The Sangha is a word for community. So the brothers and sisters who are following the Dharma, who are the Buddhist practitioners, they become the Sangha. So it's the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the three jewels. So this is the essence of, of all the, the refuge that we take. We're taking refuge in this. And this Buddha nature is within ourselves. And this is one of the things that we are looking to be able to discover and to be able to stabilize within ourselves. Buddha is a Sanskrit word that means awakened one, the awakened one. So all this wisdom, all this understanding is potential within ourselves and it's a matter of being able to um, <clears throat> overcome the emotions and our um, misguided thoughts that hold us on to things that are uh, not necessarily true and these things block us they obstruct us from what our true nature is and our true nature is our buddha nature now this buddha nature is not exclusive we call it Buddha nature in this particular tradition, in the Buddha tradition. But there are other traditions that are just as valid. And I'm talking about Christianity. I'm talking about um, Judaism. I'm talking about Hinduism. Talking about um, uh, Islam, Muslim. Talking about Taoism. Even in humanistic uh, practices and thought. The essence of what we all are, this true nature, is expressed in different terms. In Christianity, it's the Christ. In Judaism, it has a name for that, God. And in uh, um, uh, Hinduism, it has many different names. And in uh, Taoism, it has the tenth. Uh, it has it has the the way, the Tao Te Ching, the way, the way of virtue. 
So each of these different traditions is trying to explain this true nature that is in our heart center in these different ways. In Buddhism, we call it our Buddha nature. And this is like the perfection of what it is to be a human being. So we're taking refuge in that, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the mind of the Buddha, the speech of the Buddha, and the body of the Buddha. So we recite this prayer. <clears throat> in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangha cho dang so ki cho nam la shang ju ba du dagni kab su chi dagi jin so ki pe so nam gi Jo la pen shir sangye ju pa sho. So when we take refuge, when we're taking refuge in the three jewels like this, we're visualizing that we're holding those three jewels at our heart center. This is a mindfulness practice. We do many things like this to develop mindfulness of our true nature, of what our purity is of what our potential is. So we're holding these three jewels at our heart. So my hands are, are cupped. They're not holding flat, they're cupped. So I can take my thumbs and I can put them inside my palms to help me to remember these three jewels. So I'm holding this at the heart center to remind us. And whether we are Christian, whether we are Jewish or we're Hindu or whatever tradition we might have grown up uh, uh, going to church with or believing in or whatever. Buddhism does not interfere with that in one bit. Buddhism is a philosophy. It's a philosophy of realizing who we are as human beings, who we are in our physical sense, who we are in our intellectual sense, and who we are in our spiritual sense. So most all of us are familiar with our physical sense and our intellectual sense, but for different reasons, we may have suppressed our spirituality, or we may call it something else. But what we're trying to do through our Buddhism is to recognize that it's all connected, that we are spiritual beings, whether we realize it or not. And what we are really seeking is to be able to have a balance in our lives between our physical life and our intellectual life. And that balance becomes our spirituality. And this is the commonality. This is the common nature that we have that we all share. And it's through this that we see that we are all the same, that we all have this spirituality. Spirit in, in, um, means connectedness. Spirituality means connected, connected with nature. And we are part of nature as human beings, but all the animals are connected that way. All the insects are connected that way. All of nature, all the trees, all the, the fruit and the vegetables, all the different plant life and so on. Everything that we see is all part of that nature. Even the things that seem to be inanimate to us, that don't have a, a lifetime to them, like the rocks and the sky and, and so on like that. But when we get down to it, everything has the same building blocks. Everything comes down to an atomic structure, comes to a subatomic structure, and comes to energy that is in between those, those particles of matter and so on. So in this way, we're all the same. So by recognizing that and by being able to uh, become one with that becomes our liberation of selfishness and our ego begins to break its hold on us. We give our ego uh, a job to do, which is to help facilitate our spirituality, 
to help facilitate our humanness, to be able to be a complete human being in the physical sense, in the intellectual sense, and in the spiritual sense. So our ego, our persona, becomes a, a, a vehicle for that. So by reciting this kind of prayer, this refuge prayer, helps us to remember that, to recall that. Does anybody have any questions or comments? <clears throat> okay, we got one more prayer to discuss, and that is the four immeasurables. These are the four vast immeasurables of the enlightened mind. Bodhicitta, the enlightened mind is bodhicitta, the four vast and measurable qualities of the enlightened mind. So these are loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. These four are shared by all the great beings, whether it was Gandhi or it was um, Jesus, or it was Mohammed, or it was Moses, all these great beings have these qualities that they share for all beings. So we um, remember this, we remind ourselves of this, so that we can stabilize this within ourselves. So here in this first line, we say, may all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. So the first line, may all mothers sentient beings, we're using that reference of mother, that we're seeing that we're all the same. We all come from mother. And we want to do good by our mother. We want to help our mother in every way that we can. May all mothers sentient beings, boundless as the sky, that it's in, in, we can't count them. It's immeasurable how many beings there are, how many beings there have been. And may they all have happiness and the causes of happiness. So if we understand that happiness and the causes of that happiness means that there is a wisdom that is in place. And the wisdom implies that there is a dualistic understanding because sometimes we miss the mark. Sometimes we, we're not doing things perfectly. And we have to have a wisdom for understanding how it is that we got there. Sometimes we are able to maintain that purity. We're able to maintain that goodness, that happiness, and so on. And we need to know how it is that we got there. So the causes of happiness means that we know the duality. We know the, the ways in which we can move. We know the choices that we have, and we're choosing happiness. So this is loving kindness the loving kindness that we have for ourselves, the loving kindness that we have for others, to be able to see through whatever negativity, whatever confusions there might be that may draw us to, to uh, the side of suffering, the side of confusion, the side of darkness. <clears throat> the second line here says, may they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. So to be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering means that we recognize that there is compassion, that we have compassion, that there is suffering, that sometimes we're, we're not in that happiness, there is this suffering, but we have compassion for that. We have compassion for ourselves and we have compassion for other beings. So to do that, we have to be able to look through what those um, what that negativity is, what that confusion is. We need to be able to look through what that happiness, we need to look through and be able to um, change our choices. So we have compassion to be able to do that. Compassion is the other side of the hand of wisdom. It's two sides of the same hand, wisdom on one side, compassion on the other. And they're both always there. It's part of our phenomenal nature, our dualistic nature. Many times we live in the ignorance 
of that compassion. We live in the ignorance of that wisdom. But we need to recognize, we need to bring light to that. So this is one of the things, this is how we are awakening to our dualistic nature so that we can make the correct choices to be able to overcome our suffering. The next line is, may there be, uh, may there never be separate, may they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. So to be free from sorrow and, um, and never be separated from it means that we are in pure joy. We are in empathetic joy. Empathetic joy means that we have joy within ourselves that we recognize this, but there are other beings who they have their joy and we recognize that too. And we may not have had anything to do with their happiness and their joy, but at the same time, we're not trying to claim that we did have anything to do with it, even if we did. They recognize it and now we are sharing in that joy, that empathetic joy. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow, to be stable in joy and happiness. And then the last line, the fourth line is, may they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. So this is equanimity, the sameness, a balance, free from attachment and aversion. So this attachment and aversion is our, our is the uh, dualistic nature some things we want to hold some things we want to reject and it's part of the human condition to have to deal with this but we need to recognize that and we meet we need to make the proper uh, uh, choices so that we can rest in an equanimity through this that even if someone means us harm, even if someone is confused, we can still love them. We can still show them compassion. We can still offer them loving kindness. We can still uh, uh, relate to their joy and be able to see that there's a balance in all our lives and being able to do that. So these are the four vast and measurable qualities of the enlightened mind. So we recite this prayer three times. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. In Tibet, Manam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang de we Gurdang dam pa jorchi. Dug now dang da now gi gu dang dra wa jorchi. Dug now me pe de wa dang mi dra wa jorchi. Nay ring jag dang ni dang dra we dang nam la ne pa jorchi. So each one of these four prayers that we just recited has a, a melody to it, has a little bit of a different melody. And the melodies can be very helpful in us being able to learn the Tibetan by learning the phrasing, the way these words go together. And as we do this, as we make this part of our daily routine, we begin to memorize these prayers. And uh, we can use the melodies that help us connect um, with the uh, with the uh, the language that is being used by our teachers, by the Tibetan teachers, and by the Buddha himself. The Buddha taught in Sanskrit language, and the and the Tibetan language and the Hindi language are based on that Sanskrit language. So by reciting these these prayers in this um, um, ancient language 
connects us with the vibration of those words because those syllables are all vibrating with sacred holy meaning and that sacred holy meaning has never died it continues and we are just joining that we are harmonizing with that vibration that is going through our bodies that is going through our intellect that is, that is the spiritual vibration that is going through all of us that we can feel and and we can we can rely upon to carry us through so um we don't always have to use the melody we can chant if it's more convenient we could say uh, in this case of this prayer, we can chant this by saying something like, Manam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang de we gur dang dem bar jur jig dug nao dang dun nao gi gu dang dra war jur jig dug nao me pe de wa dang mi dra war jur jig ne ring jack dang ni dang dra we tang nam la ne par jur jig so you can see that each one of these uh, short uh, words um, all have the same weight to them, the same value, you know, so there's no phrasing. It just, they just go together at the same way. We're chanting that at the same way. Man nam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang den. So we can, we can keep time by beating, you know, using a just touching the table or something like that to help us keep the um, the meter of the way in which we recite this. So these prayers are very helpful in being able to set our motivation, our intention for doing the rest of our practice, for setting us up for the whole entire day, that we're doing this for the benefit of the enlightenment of all sentient beings. That through our work, through our endeavor, through our um, being able to recognize our spirituality, we are dedicating that to other beings, that they may achieve the same enlightenment. So thank you for listening to that again. Does anybody have any comments or questions that you'd like to talk about? <clears throat> okay. Lance? Yes, sir. I uh, I have in my study book, uh, and this must be from long ago, under the four measurables, I have a note, which must have come from you, to recite it every day. Yes. I can't say that I've been doing that, but I do it uh, often when I read this because, I, because of that note. Well, that's good, yes. And uh, along with the altruistic motivation. Yes. And the first step in developing a daily practice, because that's what we're, you know, in Buddhism 101, we're, we're kind of giving you all the, the basic tools of what it is to put together a practice for yourself to be able to develop your connection with your spirituality. And what this means is a daily practice. You know, that's our goal. And it takes us a while to get into the routine of doing that. I understand that. You know, it certainly took me a while to do it. But now it's second nature. Now, if I don't do it, I feel like I really miss something. I don't feel right the whole day. But it's rare when that happens. I'm able to always make time to be able to do these prayers at the very least and then enter into some kind of a practice. So whether it's five minutes or it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes or a half an hour, whatever it is, to develop this practice is huge. And it, it transforms your life. You know, Buddhism, any, any kind of philosophic uh, endeavor like this is a lifestyle and is saying that I'm going to change the way in which I live. I'm going to change the way in which I view myself as a human being that I have this spiritual component in my life and I'm going to do everything I can to be able to stabilize that in my life. So I'm not just a physical person. In the morning I get up, I take a shower, I put on nice clothes, I go out to work, I go to school, I do the things that I'm going to do. I want to look nice to make a good presentation. I'm taking care of my physicality. I go to the gym, I work out, I do the things I need to do to take care of my body. 
I eat well, etc. All these things to maintain my physicality. And then I use my brain. I'm using my intellect. I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm, I'm reading papers, I'm, I'm looking at uh, things and understanding it, digesting it, figuring it out, and so on, doing things to challenge myself intellectually. I'm going to work, I'm going to school, I'm developing relationships with other people. All this is intellectual um, relationship building. And that's part of being a human being. And I'm developing that. I continue to develop that all through my life. But then there's our spirituality. And now we're developing and realizing that we have this spiritual body. So we need to be able to devote time to that, just as we do to dress ourselves properly, just as we do to develop our intellect. We need to develop our spirituality and to stabilize that by taking some time out of our day to be able to do that. And then this sets up the rest of the day that not only am I going to be physically present, not only am I going to be intellectually present, but I'm going to be spiritually present in everything that I do in my body, speech, and mind, the action bodhicitta, that there's going to be the spiritual connection there. <clears throat> So the first thing that we suggest is by learning these prayers, recommending these prayer, uh, recommending to memorize these prayers is very helpful. And then you find that, wow, I've done this. I have confidence that I can do this. How much better I feel. Now let me go to the next step. What's the next thing I can do? So these are the things that we're trying to present to you. If you're taking notes on these talks that we have and so on, to reflect on those notes becomes part of the practice. You can do your opening prayers and then you reflect on the notes. You know, what did this mean? What did, what did that mean? You know, what are the five poisons? What are the five antidotes and so on? And take it apart, put it back together again. Read the books that we've suggested and so on. So that becomes part of the practice. So if you start with 15 minutes, every day, then that may grow to be 30 minutes. And that 30 minutes may grow to be 45 minutes and then grow to be a, an hour. And you find that you make time to be able to do that because you enjoy it very much. You enjoy being a spiritual person. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm sorry I go on so much. It's part of, <laughs> it comes with the territory, it seems. Okay, so something I want to talk about. Yes, Kate. So I, I just wanted to sort of follow up on what we were just talking about, that um, doing a regular practice it doesn't seem sometimes like it's making a difference, but it's like putting drops into a bucket. If you just have a little drop now and then, steady little drop, it adds up and it fills the bucket and overflows. Um, and I've noticed that with the medicine Buddha practice that you lead on Thursdays. So I did medicine Buddha off and on for years. And, you know, I knew the practice a little bit. But for the past year, I guess, I've been making an effort to take part with, with you regularly uh, and show up for your class and doing it every week like that is, I've noticed much more progress looking back than what I was getting before with just sort of the off and on. And that was not even a daily practice for me. That was a weekly practice. So the things I do daily, like these little prayers, uh, yeah, it makes a huge difference, even if it doesn't feel like it at first. Very good. Thank you very much for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, and, and that's exactly right. It takes a little bit of time, but you after you commit to, to doing that and you see what a difference it makes. No, absolutely. I agree with everything that you said. Thank you. So, in the past weeks, we've been talking about um, suffering. We've been talking about emotions. 
We've been talking about the causes of those emotions, the five poisons. We've been talking about how to um, uh, get over those causes to be able to neutralize those causes through the antidotes of the poisons, which then manifests as doing good deeds. So the deeds are the actions that we take, and those actions are the, the karma. We talked a, a quite a bit about karma. There's good karma, there's bad karma. The karma is the actions that we take. Karma is a Sanskrit word that means action. So um, we can have a bad deed, or excuse me, a bad cause, a negative cause, but we can apply a good action to that. We can apply a good uh, antidote to that that has a positive result. Likewise, we can have a good uh, cause for a good action, a good cause, but instead we do a negative action that has a negative result. The negative result is suffering. The positive result is happiness. So we can see how successful we are in our actions by what degree we are happy, what degree we are suffering. And by being honest with ourselves and taking a look at this and using our meditation, using this time that we spend doing these prayers, etc., as examining what, it, what we've been doing for that day, what we're going to do for that day, what we did yesterday, and so on like that, using that time to be able to kind of withdraw, to be able to get an objective view on who we are, what it is that we're doing. And it's through this observation and applying the tools that we've been talking about that we're able to change. We're able to transform ourselves into being more of a happier, balanced person, a more of a spiritual person like that. So we looked at what the results were of our karma, where we can wind up in different um, uh, uh, places in our mind, in our heart mind, in our intellectual mind, and like that. So the Buddha taught something called the Four Noble Truths. And this was his very first teaching that he gave after he attained enlightenment. And he taught this to his five disciples. And we're going to go through and uh, uh, look at the life of the Buddha in another couple of weeks. So, but this section here right now is relevant to talk about this and, and so to introduce this and then we'll be talking, it, uh, talking about it again in, in more context with the rest of his life. But right now, we want to say, what are these four noble truths that the Buddha taught? So, the thing that was the motivation for Buddha to want to be able to understand to have an enlightenment was to have the enlightenment of why it is that human beings suffer it was just really that simple because he recognized that there was suffering all over the place by so many people in so many different ways and it seemed unfathomable to be able to understand how all this works and so on. There's so There were so many myriad dynamics that were happening. So he uh, sought to find a way to be able to understand. So through his enlightenment and the process of that enlightenment was meditation, was being able to withdraw, which we'll talk more about. But he was able to recognize the first noble truth is that all beings has suffering in it. Now, that doesn't mean that all life is suffering. Some beings may have all life as suffering, but most beings have some degree of suffering and some degree of happiness, and it's very changeable. It changes during the course of our life, the things that would have upset us when we were a child wouldn't necessarily uh, upset us when we're an adult, but and vice versa. So we can see that there's these dynamics that happen in our lifetime. And all this is, is reason to be able to, to meditate, to be able to, to look at all of this. So this suffering, this, 
this cause of suffering is that we want to have this life, that we want to have this desire, we want to have these things. And these things, this life itself is the cause of our suffering. So why do we have suffering? Because we want to have this life, we want to have this body, we want to have this car, we want to have this house, we want to have this job. And none of it is completely 100% pure happiness. It comes with all kinds of hidden responsibilities and, and things that we, we just couldn't predict that was going to happen. We get sick, we get injured, we get old, things happen. Our car wears out, our clothing wears out. We lose our job. We have to go get a new job. Our, our relationships um, uh, come together, but then we can't maintain them because we find that there's conflict in our relationships that began as a wonderful love relationship now has become one of mistrust and jealousy and, and so on like that. So we see that things change. It's all very dynamic. And, and so <clears throat> the cause of our suffering is our attachment, is our wanting to have this life, wanting to have this body, wanting to have all these physical things, wanting to have all these intellectual things, wanting to have this job and these relationships and so on like that. <clears throat> so that's the first and the second of the noble truths. The third of the noble truth is that to renounce this, we have to be able to cut this off. We have to be able to cut off our attachment. We have to be able to cut off our aversion to these things, these aversions to, to uh, difficulties. We have to be able to, to look through those difficulties like we did in the altruistic motivation prayer and say, well, no, I just can't suppress that. I got to be able to go and I have to be able to neutralize that. I have to be able to understand the cause of that in order to make it stop. I'm not going to be able to put it into a box. I'm not going to be able to bury it. I'm not going to be able to forget about it. I have to diffuse it because it has a great deal of energy. And when we are able to diffuse that energy, now we can use that energy for our happiness. Now we can use that energy to be able to help other beings. We're transforming what was negativity, what was confusion to us, and we're able to use that now for the sake of enlightenment, for the sake of happiness, not for ourselves selfishly, but for the benefit of others. So the third truth is the renunciation, the cessation of suffering. So it comes, so this is a responsibility of ours. The suffering, the, 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 the first truth, the suffering is the result of the cause of suffering, the second truth. The third truth is the result of now what becomes the fourth truth. The fourth truth gets a little bit more complicated and this is what I wanted to talk about because we have to talk about this several times to be able to really get it to start meaning something for us. And that is the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is a way of having a guide, having a, a short eight-point check of what we are doing in our lives. So I'm going to screen share this with you right now. So I hope you're taking notes. It'll help you. Okay, so if you can see this. Whoops. What happened here? Sorry. There we go. All right, so here's the Four Noble Truths. All existence has suffering. Number two, the cause of suffering is desire or the emotions. The cessation of suffering is unattachment by being able to renounce, to be able to separate ourselves from the suffering by diffusing the cause of that suffering. 
And we do that through the Eightfold Path, the means for ending suffering. So the Eightfold Path is here. You may have heard this. The first one is right view. The second one is right resolve. The third one is right speech. The fourth is right conduct. The fifth is right livelihood. The sixth is right effort. Seven is right mindfulness. And the eighth one is right concentration. So what does this mean? We're on this pathway. We're deciding that we want to become a better human being. We want to become a spiritual human being. We want to have ourselves become enlightened to the causes of suffering and the causes of happiness. And we want to be, we want to take responsibility for ourselves and to be able to help other beings to be able to stabilize on this path to be able to identify this path for ourselves. So the first of these is the right view. What is the right view of being on this path? The right path, the right view is freedom. The least common denominator that all sentient beings have, whether we're human beings, whether we're animals, whether we're insects, whatever, all want to be free. We don't want to be enslaved. We don't want to be locked up. We don't want to be controlled. We want to be able to make our own decisions. We want to be able to learn from those decisions and make changes when we deem it to be necessary. We want to be able to have a code of ethics. We want to be able to see how to live a proper life. So this right view of recognizing that what we really want is to be free. So how much of us have absolute freedom? Very, pure, for, very, very few of us, because by nature of being a human being, we're entering into these relationships, we're, we're having to take care of our body, we're having to take care of our intellect, we're having to take care of our jobs, our house, all these things that become all these little little enslavements that we have willingly taken on as part of our identity, as part of our ego. And as a result, you know, we've, we've kind of enslaved ourselves, we've locked ourselves up, we've imprisoned ourselves in these, in these things that we want. We've given up some degree of freedom. When we experience true freedom, how do we do that? And what does it feel like? Well, for us, when we meditate, when we sit and we say, I'm going to take this 15 minutes, I'm going to take these 30 minutes, I'm going to take this hour, whatever it is, and I'm going to go through this process of, of focusing my mind one pointedly on my spirituality, rising above my physical rising above my intellect and just becoming my true nature, that is my big mind and my heart center, we have a moment, we have a glimpse of that freedom. And we say, wow, doesn't that feel good? Why can't I do that all the time? And then all of a sudden, here comes a thought. Well, you got to do this. Well, you got to do that. Well, the telephone is ringing. Well, you hear somebody crying or you, somebody's complaining or you hear a TV or something like that. So something in the environment disturbs you. Something in your own mind disturbs you from that moment of freedom that you had. And you say, well, how can I get back to that freedom? I really like that. How can I reconstruct my life? to have more of that freedom in my life, more balance, more happiness, more understanding in my life. So that's the first of this Eightfold Path, that we want freedom and that we can have freedom, but we have to design our life with that in mind. We may have wanted it in the beginning, we may have thought that, oh, I'm going to be born 
I'm going to have a human body and I'm going to be able to do all these things. But to be able to do that, now I got to make all these deals along the way. How many of us think, oh, well, in this lifetime, I'm going through this, I'm doing that, I'm making these choices. And <clears throat> in my nice next life, I'm going to have a, a better life. Or maybe I'm doing it right now in this life. And in a year from now, I'm going to be much happier than I am right now because of these things. But meanwhile, you got all these things that you got to do to get to that point. So it's realizing that there is this dynamic stuff that happens and taking responsibility for that. So that brings us to the next of the Eightfold Path, which is right resolve, that we stay on this path, that we're using a system, that I resolve myself, that I am going to use this plan, I am going to use this system to be able to establish this one-pointed mindfulness that is going to bring me that freedom that I really want to have. If I can be free all the time and sit in the sun and just enjoy myself, my, what a wonderful life this would be. But instead, I make all these deals and I got to go to work and I got to do these things. And maybe I get a, a week during the summertime where I can go to the beach and I finally get to go to the beach and it rains that whole week. So we have to find ways in which we can manage things that we're happy despite the rain, despite the work that we are doing, despite the things that we are working for, that we have responsibility for. So we need a system by which we can do that. And this is our right resolve that we are going to, to, we're going to work at this system. We're going to develop this system. But we don't have to invent it ourselves. It's already there for us. This is what the Dharma teachings are all about. This is what the Buddha teachings are all about, is identifying all these different aspects of, of what this is. So this right resolve, actually, if you can visualize it, it becomes like an umbrella in the regard that it is protecting us from those things that are falling around us, that are coming from wherever, that are disrupting our, our, our being able to stabilize ourselves. So it's a protection. This resolve is our protection. And the more that we're able to engage in the resolve, the more, engage, the more protected we become from the vicissitudes, the changes that are happening in life all the time. So how do we do that? What's the next step? The next step is number three, right speech. Right speech means to always tell the truth. The thing that we get caught up in is our delusions. The overarching emotion that we suffer is ignorance. And ignorance can be defined as our delusions. The things that we create for ourselves, the lies that we tell ourselves in order to make ourselves feel good in the midst of all this confusion, this chaos that is our life. So we can think that we're doing something that's making us happy, and maybe for certain times it will be, but things change, you know? We get into relationships, the relationships change. We're young, we, we develop, you know, our plan as a young person, but then as we get older, our body doesn't support that kind of effort that we used to be able to do when we were young. Our body changes, our intellect changes. We can't think in the same way that we did when we were young and so on. So we always have to be able to speak the truth. We have to have the right speech to be able to admit to ourselves and to other people what it is that we're doing that doesn't get us caught into a web of delusion, doesn't further that web of delusion. And if we recognize that we are in a web of delusion, we admit that. We recognize that and we begin to find a way to be able to liberate ourselves 
from that web. And the first thing we got to do is not to increase the web. So we have to speak the truth. So human beings innately think they know everything. Human beings on this planet are the supreme beings, aren't they? among all the animal world and the insects and so on. But human beings in relation to the rest of nature knows nothing. We don't know how we got here. We don't know how the trees got here. We don't know how the, the sky got here. We don't know how the planets got here. We don't know all these things. We're trying to put together a story that makes us feel comfortable that we can tell each other, we can tell ourselves, that gives us some degree of protection, that I understand what's going on, you know, this, this science, this, this folly of what human beings think that they can know what all of this is in all of its contact, all of its context, all of its, all of its ways of, of manifesting and so on like that. So human beings have this tendency to think that they can know. And there's very little that we really know in relation to all this. I mean, after all, I mean, human beings have only been around, what, a million years or something. But how, how old is, is all this nature? You know, billions of years old. How many beings have there been? There's been gazillions, uncountable number of beings. Why is it that just we would, ha would have this capability of being able to understand this? So being able to accept that we can't know everything. And what we know is very little, is just our imagination saying, well, it's this, that, or the other things, and we agree on these conventions of things. So this is all right speech. This is speaking the truth and being able to say, I don't know when I don't know instead of creating some kind of a story that makes you feel good and makes other people feel good or makes other people want to respect you because everybody wants to be respected. So if, if they're asking you something you don't know, but instead you tell them some kind of a story, then that's, uh, you know, that's deepening the web. That's, in, that's increasing the web. Now you can say, hey, Lance, what are you doing right now? You don't know what all this is and so on, but you're telling us to follow these instructions and so on. What I'm telling you to follow is that we don't know and that there's a way to be able to be free in that. There's a, there's a way to be liberated in that and to live within our means, to live within our lifetime, to live within being a happy, satisfied human being instead of grasping and clinging to all these things that we think we want. And when we get them, we find that there's all these different kinds of deals that have to be made and confusions and so on. So next is, well, how do we do this? I can say this, but how do we do this? We come to then the fourth one, which is right conduct. And this right conduct is, is our behavior in the midst of all these things that we're able to do, all this movement, all these things that we're able to manifest for ourselves. How do we conduct ourselves? Are we conducting ourselves morally? Have we created a moral system of values for ourselves? And do we follow that moral system of values at our convenience? Or are we doing this for the benefit of all beings? So we have to look at, at what, their, what this morality is and to be able to stay within that bounds of morality to not bring further harm to ourselves or to other beings. To have right conduct is to be on this path and not again to be increasing attachments and aversions, not to be worried about, well, if I had bad conduct because I wanted to have that bicycle, and I just lifted that bicycle off of somebody's porch and rode away with it. Now I'm spending the rest of my time looking over my shoulder. Is somebody going to be running after me 
either figuratively or, or really, you know, trying to uh, recover their bicycle. Maybe the cops are coming after me. You know, maybe I've I've stolen some money, or maybe I've 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 I've, uh, I've cheated on in something, uh, some way. You know, at school, or I've I've, I've uh, uh, I did something to get this job. I I I, I fudged the uh, the um, the resume that I that I wrote down. Are they going to catch up to me and so on? Do I have a sense of shame about the negative things that I do, or am I am I relaxed? Am I happy because I've always told the truth and I've always uh, done good behavior? I didn't bring um, suffering to myself or to other beings. So by having a value system of looking at my behavior, looking at my conduct and maintaining that to be able to stay on the path now is able to liberate myself from further suffering. <clears throat> More freedom. So then that brings me to number five, to have the right livelihood. That we live in society. Human beings are societal beings. They have to live with each other and we have to help each other and we all can't be responsible for all the things that need to be done in our communities some people need lawyers some people need doctors some people need carpenters some people need trash collectors some people need soldiers some need, people need um, policemen all these different job descriptions that we have. Some people need to be mothers. Some people need to be fathers. All these different things that we need to do. Do I have the right livelihood in this? Am I being integrated in the society in a healthy way? And does that change over time? What suits me when I'm 20 years old may change when I'm 30 years old. And then that may change when I'm 40 years old, et cetera, et cetera. And so am I in a livelihood <clears throat> that allows me to, to, um, to grow and to be able to, uh, to move about, to be able to withdraw when I need to withdraw, but to engage when I need to withdraw, uh, to, to engage? Am I in the right livelihood? Am I adding something to the community pie, so to speak? Or am I just taking from the community pie? How, what is my relationship with that? How, how broad am I looking at it? How narrow am I looking at it? And finding what makes me happy. <clears throat> some people, you know, they just don't have the ability to, to do some of these things. Other people have a very natural tendency to be able to do some things. But we have respect for everybody. You know, we need to have the policemen. We need to have the military. We need to have the, the sanitation workers. We need to have the people who are building new homes for us and, and new businesses for us. We need to have the business people. We need to have the, the architects. We need to have all these things. What are we suited for? So we have to look at that. And we have to take responsibility for that too. And there may be things that we do where we make bad choices. That's part of life. You know, going through our teenage years, you know, if you have teenagers at home or if you can remember your own teenage years, how many mistakes we made and how we tried to uh, uh, confuse the issue by, by lying and living, creating delusions for ourselves and our parents and so on and rationalizing you know, the reasons why we did things and so on. But then when we get into our 20s, it gets a little bit more serious. But how many people are making decisions in their 20s that really lock them into a whole lifetime of living in a certain way? Maybe they take a mortgage on a house or something like that, but maybe they find they don't like the house or maybe they don't like the job that they have to support the house, you know? But do they continue to live in that lie? Do they continue to live in that delusion? Or do they say, hey, I made a mistake and I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to be able to find a way to, to cut these, these roots of my entanglement 
with this mortgage or with this job or whatever it is and be able to back up. And maybe there was another choice that I, I could have made at, at a critical time. Maybe I need to go back to that choice. Or maybe I need to re-explore and find that there's other choices that I hadn't considered before. So all this is all part of, of having the right livelihood, of looking at the dynamics of how we are in our society and like that. <clears throat> so this keeps us free. If we are in this right livelihood, if we are sensing, uh, sensing that these responsibilities are what is either allowing us to be free or to be entangling us and preventing our freedom, you have to look at that. So the sixth one then is the right effort, that we are moving forward. We're not moving backward. We're not moving in a lateral way. Or we're not going in circles. Now, sometimes we do. Sometimes we have to for different circumstances, but we need to be making the right effort. We need to be looking at where it is that we want to be. We need to be able to see where the obstacles are and what, and what we need to do to overcome those obstacles. Maybe we can um, disperse those obstacles in some way. Maybe we can go around those obstacles. There's a lot of different things, but we need to be able to analyze that to be able to see. And using the right positive motivation. What's the positive motivation? The positive motivation is bodhicitta. Loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. The action bodhicitta. That if everything that we do has those four immeasurable those four immeasurable qualities in it, then we're moving it with right effort. That we're doing this for the benefit of others. And by doing the benefit for others, it comes back and it, and it helps us. It allows us to be free. It allows us to be satisfied and happy. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions or comments before we continue to go on here? Yes, Kate. So I was thinking about uh, right speech, yes. and you said it's uh, speaking truth. Yes. But I wonder if there's more to it than that, because let's say I get angry at someone. I start yelling at them, and maybe everything I say about what they did is factually correct, but the way I'm saying it is very hurtful. That doesn't seem right to me. Well, you're right, and you're absolutely right, and that's involved in there, and, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the the 10 virtues and the 10 non-virtues. Okay. Yes, so that is part so, of it. And we see that these all systems all interlock with each other. Mm -hmm. So this eightfold path, remember, was the very first teaching that the Buddha gave. And so it became the framework on all the other Dharma teachings hung on these four noble truths. So those 10 virtues and 10 non-virtues became a little bit more detail of what that right speech would be. So you're absolutely right. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. And that's what we find, you know, that the more that we get into this philosophy of the Dharma, we see the interconnectedness of it. We see the beauty of this. And we appreciate the genius of the Buddha who is able to bring all this together for us so that we don't have to invent it all by ourselves. I'm certainly not capable of doing it. You know, it was many years before I discovered the Dharma. And up to that point, I, I, I had a very confused life. But once I recognize the Dharma and start applying the Dharma, my life got simpler. It got happier. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Lance, first of all, I apologize for being late. I had a work uh, obligation that went over time, but I wanted to one thing I don't want to say confounds me, but it's something I think a lot about is right livelihood. Yes. 
And it see, I, I'm not making a political or economic statement here, but it seems like in our modern Western society, those that are involved in the protection of capital, the protection of wealth, tend to make a lot of money, and our teachers and our other public servants don't. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Say again. Sorry, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's almost like balancing right livelihood with the, the need to pay a mortgage in Northern Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And it's putting all that into, you know, the, uh, the balance of things and figuring out what's right, you know, and, and there's a couple of things that come to mind, you know, by, uh, we, we talk about in, in, in Buddhist culture, you know, they talk about that this is a degenerate age. And what that means is that at one time, and in other philosophies, they talk about this too, but maybe in different terms. At one time, everything was was very spiritual. Everything was in completely in balance. Everything was completely pure and awakened. But then there has been this devolution of going down, and we can look at history and see all the terrible things that have happened to human beings that they have done to each other and so on through all the different cultures and civilizations and so on. And <clears throat> there are many who would say, oh, it's already bottomed out. It bottomed out in 1940s. That's when it bottomed out. And now we're making our way back up. But we're not there yet. You know, we're still going through you know, the echoes of, of things that happened during that period of time in the 1940s. Maybe maybe it's our delusion to say that it, it happened in 1940. Maybe the, the bottoming hasn't come until uh, 2525. Who knows? You know, but the point is that there is this, this circular movement. There is this movement that we are part of, this continuum that we are part of, and that we have to take responsibility for our piece of that, for where we are in that midst. To look at it in the story of human beings, there's always been misery. There's always been theft. There's always been manipulation of one people against another people. It's, but there's always been those people who said, I'm not playing that game. I'm going to go live out in the mountains. I'm going to go live on the beach. I'm not going to play that game that they're playing in the cities and the towns and the villages and so on. So it may, it's easier said than done. I know. But at the same time, it's our choice. So how can we deal with the, um, the, um, the bargains that we made? How can we deal with the, the architecture of our life? Is it on, what's the foundation like? Is the building going to fall down because we didn't have a good foundation? What's the foundation made of? Is it made of physical strength? Is it made of intellectual strength? Is it made of spiritual strength? And to be able to look at our lives and say, you know what, I'm realizing this now. I may be middle-aged right now, but I still have the rest of my life to do. Am I going to just live the folly, the delusion that I've gotten to this point? Or am I going to redesign? Am I going to reconfigure my life for the rest of my life and, and be able to uh, make some corrections? As hard as it might seem to be. Or maybe it's easy. And I can tell you this, that for myself, what was difficult, but having the right aspiration and, and contemplating on it, meditating on it, using the other eightfold path and everything, all of a sudden there became a, a clarity. All of a sudden there became a hole in the clouds that I was able to go through, that sunshine came and make those changes that seem to be impossible just a short time before that. So freedom is available to us. Thank you. So that's a, 
that's an important question what you asked and we all and that's what our meditation is about that's what our contemplation is about is figuring that out each one has to do it for themselves are you ready to you know the question becomes are you ready to take on that responsibility for yourself the responsibility of your happiness or the responsibility of your suffering Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Well, then let's continue on. Okay, so we've covered the first uh, six of the Eightfold Path. Now we come to right mindfulness. Right mindfulness means that we are thinking properly, that we are taking all these variables and we have the space and time and the tools and the, the meanings, the evaluations to be able to put this all together. And so we have to question everything. We have to question the understood words that we think we understand the meaning of. You know, what is spirituality? Do you really know what spirituality is? Or should we look it up in the dictionary? Do we really know what delusion is? Or should we look that up in the dictionary? So questioning all these things and being able to look at these things, be able to, to look at what other people have to say about these things. People that may be greater than us or people that may be uh, less than us in terms of their abilities or whatever, but we can learn from everybody. We can learn from our failures. We can learn from other people's failures. We can learn from their successes. And to be able to put this into the proper um, network of, of, of observation and testing is all developing right mindfulness and being able to give ourselves the space and time to be able to do this you know we we came out of school and we say wow you know i, I graduated school when i was 21 or 24 or 28 i went to graduate school or doctorate school whatever and everything i don't have to go back to that i don't have to study anything more i can take my job and i can make money and i can just relax and and get my one week on the beach during the summertime and i'm happy i can have my mortgage and drive my nice car and have a nice family and do all those things i don't have to think about anything anymore or are you reevaluating all the time are you looking at things with with new criteria you know, bringing new things. Are you reading books? Are you looking at what other people are saying and, and making critical thinking? Where is our critical thinking? What are we doing? Look at the politics. Look at the science, the technology. Look at all this stuff critically. What are we really doing? Is it good? Is it a waste of time? Is it a waste of money? Is it, is it, for the benefit of, of all beings, or is it selfishly being squandered by a few and we get a little bit of the dribs and drabs just enough to make us happy? How are we being manipulated? How are we being controlled? Are we being controlled? Are we being the controllers? Are we doing this to other people? Are we the ones who is the dominatrix? Or we're the ones who are who are manipulating other beings for our benefit. And we give them little pieces, little nuggets or something, and it's up to them to purify them, to put them into the smelter and let them get their own gold. Let them figure out how to do it. Or are we helping people to see it for themselves, to, to recognize how to do it and so on? So all this is all right mindfulness. Looking at the intellect, and being able to bring it together with our spirituality. We have a little mind, this intellect, but we have a big mind, which is our spirituality. And it's all one mind, but this little mind is insidious. 
It's where our ego is. It's where the emotions are. And this little mind can totally block up the freedom of this heart center, of this true nature, of our spirituality. We can become so obsessive with all the stuff that is conjured up, fabricated by the intellectual mind that we can't breathe fresh air because we blocked it up with all this confusion. <clears throat> Excuse me, we have to. <clears throat> so we need to make the time. How do we do this? By dedicating time when we can withdraw, to have a place where we can grow, where we can go to withdraw, to be able to take a time out. And maybe it's just as simple as having a corner of a room in your home for a half an hour a day or an hour, whatever you've got, to go and say, I'm going to go make a comfortable place. I'm going to have some objects of mindfulness that, that give me the, the, the thoughts, that help me focus on what it is that I'm trying to focus upon, that freedom my livelihood, the effort, all these things that we're talking about that become mnemonics, that become triggers to help us to recall what is, what is our motivation, what is our intention. And I go to this place and I spend that time there and I develop this technique and I use the, the template that is being given to me by my teachers. And maybe this system of Buddhism doesn't work for me, but maybe there's another system that works better. That's fine. Use that system, whatever it is. Maybe it's, it's, it's just stress relief meditation motivation. Is, that's fine. Maybe it's humanistic philosophy. Maybe it's Taoism. Maybe it's, it's Christianity. It doesn't, that part doesn't matter. The, is, the, the important thing is taking the time, having the place to be able to do that and to be able to grow with it, to be able to get that overview, to get that mindfulness, to be able to see that I can, I can work with this. And then that leads us to number eight, which is the right concentration, that all these things are within us, that we become this temple. We, our body, our intellect, and our spirituality now becomes the vase that holds all of this, that we become a complete human being that is balanced, that has the correct foundation, and that if any one of those things falls out of balance, maybe we get sick, we get physically sick, or we injure ourselves, and we can't go to work for a week or two, or uh, we, we can't meditate for a week or two, something like that, because we're, we're so involved with our illness, with our disease, with our, um, with our injury, that we can't concentrate, we can't go to work, we can't think. At least we can't even, we can't even meditate because we're so you know, ill that our physicality is just taking all our energy, taking all our strength. You know? But we, we use a method we use a way to heal ourselves. We go to the doctor, we get the right medicines and so on. We heal ourselves, we get better, we get back in balance. Maybe our intellect, maybe we start getting very emotional over something happens in, in our life. Maybe something in the family, there's a death or so many different things can happen in our families and our relationships and so on that causes this emotional stress and so on, and we can't meditate, and we start getting ill. We start getting psychosomatic illnesses. How many people do you know that become hypochondriacs and things like that? They're constantly running to the doctor. They need the attention from the doctor for one reason or another. They start developing phobias and so on, and their egos get attached to that. The ego will attach to anything. I'll be the best, you know, um, phobe you can think of <laughs> you know what are they talk acrophobia i don't like crowds oh i don't go there i don't like crowds that's my identity i don't go there instead of trying to work at it at the fundamental level overcome that and say oh 
I can go to crowds. It's just my phobia, my fear that I've developed that I now identify with and it feeds back on itself and so on. So it's looking at these things and, and to not have our spirituality because we're so much involved with our physicality. We're so much involved with our intellectualism that there's no time for our spirituality. So we minimize it. We say, oh, I don't have time for that. Maybe next year, maybe another life or something. I don't have, I can appreciate it. It sounds good, but I don't have time for it now. So we're making choices instead of saying, wow, this really sounds like something that, that really makes sense to me. I can be a complete balanced human being. I need to waken up this right concentration. I need to see myself as a whole complete human being and utilize all this and what results is freedom and the way the freedom comes is now this eightfold path results in the cessation of suffering of our attachments or our aversions or our jealousies or our delusions or our greed the five poisons and uh, that we've talked about in the past weeks so these four noble truths you see becomes the, the frame on which the Buddha taught all these things hangs on this, on this frame. It doesn't mean that we have to be suffering all the time, but it does help us to identify that we are in the ocean of suffering samsara and that we take responsibility for it and that we can liberate ourselves to get to what we call nirvana. So by understanding all these words, all these ideas, taking the time to do this is what stabilizes us in order to be able to achieve this. Any comments or questions about that? In the, in the beginning, Lance, you had mentioned that or used the point like a, uh, or the phrase like an eight point check. Yes. Talking about the, the eightfold path. Yes. But that you you mean like um using it as something to reflect on and then to see if things are out of balance and make sure we're like investing in each of these things? Correct. Okay. You know, when you said when in your meditation place, what I would hope that you would do for your own benefit would be to have a place where you keep all your notes, where mm -hmm. you keep all your books within an arm's reach or you know, close by so that when you're sitting there in contemplation and something comes up you say oh yes we talked about that let me get that note out let me get that book out let me go back and reference that and and that becomes your your meditation practice for that particular session you know to go back and do that it's impossible for us to remember all this What's the definition of an educated person? You ever hear this? What's the mm -hmm. definition of an educated person? No takers? Someone who knows how to learn maybe or how to... Well, close. Yeah. Knows how to reference information. Mm -hmm. Knows how to use the library. You know, sometimes we can conjure it up, you know, through just sitting there and, and that wisdom comes up. Oh, I remember that now, you know, or sometimes it says, oh, that's all my note that is over here in this, 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 uh, this book that I've got. That's an educated person. So we can be an educated spiritual person is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. We're bringing the intellectual mind together with the spiritual mind. This is great. This does many things for us. But in doing that, it also can be a great blockage for this. This is our true nature. When we die, what happens? All this goes away. This goes with the body. Why don't we remember any past lifetime that we might have had or anything like that 
whether it's true or not we you know we can't remember maybe it's not true maybe it is true whatever we have trouble remembering what happened yesterday or last year or something but what about this when you make a love connection you can go through all kinds of changes in your life but you remember that love connection the love that you have for your mother and father or the caretakers who raised you, you can just quiet your mind for a moment and you can, <clears throat> you can recall that love. Not just up here, but in here. This is indestructible wisdom. This is indestructible love. And this is what we, this is what we need to recognize that when we pass that this is liberated this dies this is liberated where does it go it goes into that vibration it goes into that continuum that i was using as an example that we're all part of where were we before we were born where was our consciousness what is consciousness I mean, that opens up many conversations that we have in Buddhism 101. But that, that continuum, you see, combines with the physical body of the mother and the father, combines with the, the egg of the mother and the sperm of the father, and then that spirit comes together. And then that zygote begins to develop inside the mother's womb, and finally it's born as a as an infant and we take on our life our life begins as a human being or you could say it is it, it comes together at conception you know so by recognizing the possibility of that whether it's true or not we don't can you say it's true? Can you say it's not true? Just look at the possibility of it. it. Becomes a spiritual investigation. Yeah, I like this is a helpful actually for me the way of looking at the eightfold path because and obviously it all like pervades all the other teachings. So it's like the concepts are foreign, but I never quite knew how to relate to it to be honest because it's like the the path part always threw me off. It's not like something like the Lam Rim or something where like, okay, there's these like steps of the path. Right. And they're not really like steps necessarily. It's just like all the different things. So I like that of using it as like almost a checklist or something to like areas to be investing in and or uh, finding balance in or something. That's a much more helpful way for me to look at it. Yes. Yeah. So whether you memorize it or you keep it handy someplace where you can uh, reference it when you need to, but the more that you reference it, the more you become the embodiment of all this wisdom. And the compassion is the method of being able to actualize that wisdom. Two sides of the same hand. There's the wisdom, and then there's the actualization of the wisdom. Okay. <clears throat> so I didn't leave any time tonight to talk, to uh, do a practice, to do our Manjushri practice tonight. But I thought that this was very important to introduce this topic of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. So, um, as I said, we're going to continue this when we talk about the life of the Buddha. And I think that this aspect will make more sense to you when we relate it to in the context of the Buddha's life. And you'll see that it is a, um, it's like a, um, an example of our lives. No different than that.
Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, for those of you that have the book, the 101 book, I would like to do our dedication. And uh, we haven't described the dedication prayer by Lord Jigden Sumgun on page 21 in our prayer book. So I can uh, screen share this for those of you who don't have it. And um, I sent out some book packages to people who gave me addresses. And when you get home, you'll, you'll find them. And uh, if you haven't gotten yours and you want one, if I don't have your address, simply send it to me and I'll uh, email it to me and I'll be more than happy to uh, send it to you. Um, okay. And then uh, Kate was making a point that this next week at uh, Dharma Surya in Virginia is going to, it's an important week. If you all can come, I'm going to be down there for a couple days. And if you come, I got books down there and I can share with you and so on. And we can maybe have some time to talk. It would be wonderful. Meet Kate. And um, there's some other people there that you'll be able to meet. Maybe Gary can be there. Uh, so, um It'll be a good a good time to see and share with the community of the Sangha. When we talk about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, the community of, of Buddhists, well, this is that physical community of the of the of the Sangha. Okay. Okay, so here is the dedication prayer by Lord Jigden Sumgun. So Lord Jigden Sumgun is the founder of this lineage, our lineage, the Drikung Kagyu lineage, that is now over 800 years old. It's an unbroken lineage of master, disciple, who becomes a master, who has disciples, who become masters, who have disciples, and so on. So this has gone on for 800 years. We're all part of the lineage of the Buddha, the Buddha Shakyamuni, who lived 2,600 years ago. And then through all the different changes, the evolution of Buddhism, the culture of Buddhism, the way it's gone into different nationalities and so on is part of the wonderful story of Buddhism. And that's stuff that we can talk about, but it's also stuff you can read about. There's many great books that I'd be more than glad to introduce to you uh, that uh, you can study and, and so on like that. Anyway, so Lord Jigden Sumgun wrote many important uh, um, texts and uh, prayers. And part of his gift was his simplicity and his directness. Some writers were very elaborate, very embellished with all kinds of flowery references and words and so on. Jigden Sumgun was very direct. So there's a great benefit to that. This, this uh, uh, lineage, the Drikung Kagyu lineage, is the lineage of the yogis. It's the oral lineage of the yogis, that these teachings were passed down orally and they weren't written down for many years and when they were then they become something that would grow very quickly because now people had something of of uh, genuine authority to uh to go to to keep their 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 mindfulness correct and so on so this prayer here is the dedication prayer where we are dedicating whatever wisdom and merit that we have developed through this practice, through this teaching, through whatever endeavor we do, whatever wisdom and merit results from this, we are dedicating to the enlightenment of other beings, that we're selfishly not holding on to it for ourselves. <clears throat> so we go through this. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas. Divine assembly of Yidams and assemblies of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis, and Dakinis dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. So now I'm going to define this. 
glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas. So the root lamas are those who teach us or show us the way, show us our true nature, our heart nature, our big mind. Those are the root lamas. And we may only have one in our whole entire lifetime. We may have several who um, maybe introduce us to a certain aspect for a certain period of time. But then as we grow, we then meet another Lama who then takes us further beyond where the first Lama took us. And so our root has become deeper and has become broader and so on. So we may have one root Lama, we have many root Lamas. The ultimate root Lama, of course, is Buddha Shakyamuni, that all this teaching comes from Buddha Shakyamuni. And from Buddha Shakyamuni, it comes the, the Buddha, what we call the primordial Buddha, so pure as unborn. So we'll talk about that another time. But that, that pure nature of Buddha Shakyamuni, from which that wisdom that he is talking from, the, the awakening that we all share in. So, so the kind root Lama, the lineage Lamas then are all the Lamas that have come uh, hundreds and thousands and thousands and thousands of teachers that have come out of the different lineages of the different schools of the different uh, monasteries and so on that have traveled through India, that have traveled through Southeast Asia, that have traveled through uh, the Far East, that have traveled up through the, uh, the Stanic nations that go up into Russia and uh, cross over Russia, go into Siberia and into Mongolia, then those that go down into, um, into uh, Europe and go around the world and so on, all these different pathways of all these different um, uh, uh, lineage lamas. So it's only been the past 70 years or so now, 60, 70 years, that the East and the West have really come together in this way because, because the, the Buddhism was, was kept in the East. And now with the diaspora of what happened in Tibet and so on, more and more of the teachers have come out into the rest of the world. So we're benefiting from that greatly. So these different lineages are uh, represented by these lamas, these different teachers and so on. So we'll talk about the different schools of the lamas uh, next time. So the divine assembly of Yidams and the assemblies of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yogini. So the divine assembly of Yidams, the Yidams are meditational deities, meditational deities. So we begin by intellectualizing what this is. The Buddha, again, Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha, was able to intellectualize these different aspects of what it is to be not just a human being, but what it is to have the enlightened activities of being a holy enlightened being, of being a Buddha. And these holy enlightened beings are called the Yidam. And it's through these yidams, it's through these holy beings that are meditational. They don't exist in the way of flesh and blood, but they exist within us and we become the actuators of their wisdom, of their skillful means. They become our teachers. They become what we call our tutelary deities. It's through their, their eyes, through their actions, that we are able to recognize and to be able to effect the Dharma teachings. So these are the Yidams. And there's plenty of time to talk about what that means. The assemblies of Buddhas. So there's many different Buddhas. There's, there's real life Buddhas, and then there's meditational Buddhas. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. But the Buddhas are enlightened beings who are so pure, they remain in a realm of, of, of not being influenced by karma. They have transcended karma. 
They have transcended negativity. And everything that they do with their body, speech, and mind is for the benefit of the enlightenment of all beings. The bodhisattvas are wholly enlightened beings who are human beings who are on the path to become Buddhas. Buddhas are fully realized human beings. Bodhisattvas are at different levels, different degrees of that purification of becoming Buddhas. And the path that they follow is what we are, the, the we're trying to uh, engage on that path. The yogins and the yoginis. The yogins are the male practitioners who are in union with that path, with those teachings. The yoginis are the females. The yogins are the males. The yoginis are the females, and they have the same weight in terms of their importance. In Buddhism, there's no difference between whether you're a, a male or a female in terms of your spirituality. Culturally, yes, there's differences, and those differences are being reconciled. As the East and the West come together in these past 70 years, there has been refinement in that way, and there's more and more female teachers that weren't allowed in past cultures and so on that now today are coming to the fore so we're seeing that more and more the dakinis are the like the invisible energy beings who it's with their energy they are guiding us and directing us in ways that are very very uh subtle and being able to recognize that subtlety, being able to recognize their wisdom and their and their compassion in order to guide us is very profound. To do that requires contemplative, meditative practice. That all these are recognized, all these are developed, all these are cultivated through our practices, through our meditation practices, to be able to understand and recognize these subtleties. So we say that these are all dwelling in the ten directions. The ten directions are the four cardinal directions of the compass, east, south, west, and north, and the intermediate directions, southeast, <clears throat> northeast, northwest, and north northeast. Those are eight, and then up and down. Those are the ten directions. So literally what we're manifesting, what we're visualizing is a sphere that that around us, around all of us is is this sphere. So you can think of it like bubbles if you want. That we're all in these bubbles. The problem is, you know, do we stay in our bubbles and we don't allow our bubbles to all interact with each other? You know, do so what we're trying to do is open it up and see that this this Ten directions is space with no boundaries. So now we're saying, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate road of virtue. So the, the three times are the past, the present, and the future. These are the three times. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings. So we talked about that before, sentient beings, those that are born, those that suffer uh, birth, suffer um, sickness, suffer old age, and suffer death, animals, insects, etc. In samsara, the ocean of suffering. And nirvana is the liberation, is the temporary liberation from that ocean of suffering. And the innate word of virtue. The innate word of virtue is the pathway that allows us to rise to transcend that ocean of suffering and to enter into that field of nirvana to maintain that field of nirvana so as an ordinary human being we can attain that but it takes work to be able to stabilize that we can fall backwards we can have moments of retrograde where we where we forget, get confused, or seduced, so on. But we can reconstruct and get right back to where it was that where we left off through the root vert of virtue. 
So not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a shravaka, or pratya kabuda. So the eight worldly concerns we talked about before, but we haven't talked about them recently again, are the eight worldly concerns are gain and loss, pleasure and pain, praise and blame, and fame and disgrace. So just take a moment and imagine how much time you think about those eight things whether it's your actual self or it's people that you are engaging with in one way or another either directly or indirectly maybe people that you work with maybe people in your family maybe it's people that you see on television we'll talk more about this when we talk about the four thoughts that turn the mind to the dharma but these eight worldly concerns are things that we hold on to that rob us of the time and energy to be able to be developing our bodhicitta. The four causes of samsara. So samsara, the ocean of suffering, what are the four causes? The four causes are not gathering the accumulations of wisdom and compassion or wisdom and merit not accumulating that, wisdom and merit. The second one is gathering the non-virtues. That keeps us from, that's a cause of samsara. The third one is creating obstacles to others' creation of virtue, that we're standing in the way, we're manipulating other beings and developing their virtue to be able to uh, recognize their spirituality that we're manipulating them in many different ways. And then the last one is that we're not dedicating virtue, that we need to, at the conclusion of our work in a practice, in a teaching, whatever, that we're not dedicating the virtue, that we're not being mindful of dedicating this to others, that we're giving this to others. Rather, we're holding on to it selfishly and saying, oh man, I just had this session and boy, am I good. Instead of saying, I gave it away to everybody else. And that makes me feel happy. I'm glad I did that. And whatever, whatever I gain from that is wonderful. And I'll just give that, I'll dedicate that too. So it's selflessness. Um, rebirth as a Shravaka or Pratya Kabuda. So uh, Shamsara is the ocean of suffering and um, rebirth as a Shravaka. A Shravaka is a Arhat in uh, Sanskrit and it means one who is on the path but is on a selfish path, path for their own self-liberation. They are selfish. They, may, they have compassion for others. They have compassion for suffering. But their liberation is for themselves. They're not doing anything directly to help other beings. They're not sacrificing, working for others' benefit the Shravakas or Pratya Kabudas who are on that same path. However, they are a little further developed. They have great wisdom. They have great ability, but it's still selfish, selfishly motivated and they are very arrogant about it. And they're very secretive. They keep by themselves and they don't want to interact with other beings. So, at this point, we've come to nine o'clock. I don't want to keep you late. I know this is going to take longer than we have time for. So uh, let's read the rest of this, and then next week we'll come back and, and continue this discussion. So if you're taking notes, uh, that's wonderful. So we come, so now we say, May all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Mars and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, 
and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings with my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta, and through that may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I in any case gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones for the benefit of all sentient beings. Thank you all very much for paying attention. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lance, Lance, very much. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Lance. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. You're welcome. I hope to see you again soon next week. We'll be back for Medicine Buddha this Thursday if that's convenient for you to join us. Thank you. What is uh, what is the deal with the, the Medicine Buddha thing that you guys were talking about? Well, it's a practice to practice Medicine Buddha to develop uh, your realization of Medicine Buddha within yourself. So we've been doing Manjushri these past number of weeks. So he is the Bodhisattva of uh, wisdom. Mm -hmm. Medicine Buddha is the Buddha of healing. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that practice and uh, we'll be able to give a, a brief explanation of the practice. And there is a book that goes along with it. And I'll be more than glad to send you a copy of that. But I will screen share it so you can follow it as we go along and, and see. It's how we develop the, the generation of being the, the medicine Buddha, the Buddha of healing. And that's, that's something that you all do like each Thursday. There's like a group or something that runs? Correct. Oh, cool. So it's our group here and... Sometimes there's a bunch of people, sometimes it's just a few of us, but uh, we do it. Yeah, it's the same Zoom code, right? Same Zoom, same Zoom session. Oh, okay. So it's seven o'clock. So you're welcome seven to join us. At seven o'clock? At seven o'clock. On Thursday? Oh, cool. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to. Might okay, be good. Awesome. Thank you all. All right, thank you thank all. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you on Medicine Buddha Thursday. Great. Take care. Thank you. Be careful. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Katie. It's been good to see you, Lance. How's your back doing? Better. Oh, glad to hear it. I'm not out of the woods, but, uh, mm. you know, it's better. You know, there's well, certain, you know, things, uh, certain movements I'm not making, you know, but... Uh, mm. I am sure. actually, it's, it's showing, you know, real progress. Yeah, if if you're feeling good enough to make it down for Losar, uh, we'll be happy to see you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll come down that Tuesday and I'll come down that mm -hmm. Saturday. Okay, those are the two days I know I'm going to be there, Tuesday and Saturday. Yeah, and in between, I don't. Days. And Paul yeah. will probably come and. Um, Wonderful. And that'll be great. And. Uh, yeah, and right after that, they're starting up the new nay. I assume you won't be joining that. I, I'm not going to no. be able to do that. No, 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 not for you. I mean, I'll I would doing... come. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I'll be joining the first one, but then I'm going to have uh, visitors from out of town. So 
we'll see how that goes. I may be able to join one or two at the end too. Good. Yeah, in years past, I'd be there for the whole thing and I'd be reciting it even if I wasn't doing all the prostrations. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for me to stay in that kind of a position for that period of time, I'm not ready for that yet. Yeah, no, no, no. You have to take care of yourself. If you don't do it now, you won't be able to practice at all in the future. Oh, that's it. You know, uh, yeah, that's it. I got to build it up and so I can continue getting back to practice and stay healthy. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you something, and that is, uh, what's the protocol nowadays with going down, you know, to the uh, to the desk where the, my computer is and the and the mm -hmm. printer and everything? Because, you know, I noticed that there's signs up that say that this is a uh, a monastic area now and everything. Do I should I ask permission from uh, Annie? And that's fine if I do. I should do that no matter what. But I just wondered if there's been any cry, uh, policy for that. Sure. I know the signs were put up, especially for when we were having big events and people might just wander down there or children who are used to having classes down there might go down to see things or play. So we wanted to discourage that. Um, I, I don't know, I, it probably would not hurt to uh, tell Anigam, so, you know, you'd like to go down and use the computer there. You know, she knows it's a public computer. Uh, so, you know, we have, we, have, we have to strike a balance between uh, respecting private space and using the temple for, you know, everybody's purpose. Okay, well, that's good. If, um, 